constitutional, statutory, and prudential limits to any monitoring of personnel. They say that this uh, is going to have uh, a chilling effect on legitimate whistleblower communication. And of course, that is right on spot. As they pointed out in this document, they listed as examples of people that had gone wrong Thomas Drake, who is a bona fide whistleblower. He is not a threat to the government. He exposed criminal activity, but they said, Whistleblower Thomas Drake, who revealed fraud, waste, and abuse, was listed along with Nadal Hassan, Aaron Alexis, and Robert Hansen. Now, Hassan and Alexis murdered people. Hansen was a Soviet spy. Thomas Drake was a legitimate whistleblower that they tried to persecute. They say this kind of wanton misuse of the term threat demonstrates this program fails to distinguish between those who want to fix programs from those who wish to do harm to our national security. Now, at the same time, we see in the UK, Peter Preston pointing out the corruption that happens when we have people who are specialist correspondents, people who cover the beat of intelligence, for example. He says, what they're going to do is they're going to accept the official line of the espionage services. And of course, this is a problem that extends throughout journalism. The fact that people will trade their integrity for access the fact that they are being fed these stories, and of course, that's uh, where all their work is done for them by the government. All they have to do is republish the press releases that the government gives them. But listen to what he has to say here. He says, consider the threat from terrorism. The Islamic State, as with Al-Qaeda, Al-Shabaab, other current terrorist groups, needs to be put into perspective, he says. After 9-11, a very wise intelligence officer told me in 2002, we have turned 16 clever Al-Qaeda terrorists into a worldwide movement seemingly more dangerous to Americans than the communist Soviet Union with thousands of nuclear missiles. Never at the height of the Cold War did we institute the security actions at home that have been taken and are being contemplated to meet what's been described as the current terrorist threat. Yeah, we also didn't fly in uh, Russian refugees at the height of the Cold War that were all military age, uh, able-bodied soldiers. That is the core of it. That's why the war on terror has been so successful then. Think about the fact that even with all the scare and the nuclear scare that we had in the height of the Cold War, we never had the kind of totalitarian measures that we now see and the public now accepts because they buy the official story of 9-11. Now stay with us when we come back. We're gonna take a quick look at the Constitutional Convention. Is it going to solve the problems that we have? We'll see. Stay with us when we come back. Shane Steiner's involvement with InfoWarsLife.com truly happened in an organic way. I went to high school with Shane, his brother, knew his parents well, and he was visiting the office once, hadn't been to the office in years, and said, wow, I notice you're making and selling supplements. Do these really work? Because I've tried a lot of supplements as a, a workout enthusiast, and I really think most of them are hype. And I said, here, take some home, try it. Well, a few weeks later, he came in blown away and said, I want to buy three boxes of this stuff to get my friends and family. It's simply amazing. He said, why does it work so well? And I said, listen, go to InfoWarsLife.com, watch the informational videos with Dr. Group and others. They understand how it all works. I know that it works for me. That's all I understand. The science, the facts, the research, people's testimonials, they're all on InfoWarsLife.com. You can check it out for yourself. I wanted to go to the gym. I wanted to push myself and work out harder. And that led to me being able to come out and do stuff like the barefooting and the surfing and stuff like that, which what I would have never done. I, I never would have done that uh, two years ago. Shane has said over and over again, more than just libido and energy, it made him want to get into the gym more. It made him want to get in better shape. And believe me, the Steiners have amazing genetics. Uh, his brother is a world champion steer wrestler. His dad, Bobby Steiner, is a famous world champion bull rider. They've got natural genetics. But when you added this to the mix, in Shane's own words, it took him to the next level. Shane noticed the mental clarity, 
Bobby was able to work out longer and gain muscle mass. He's already completely shredded. I gotta admit, for me, the biggest effect has been libido. Now, I've never claimed to have a body like some beach model, but back when I was 20, 22 years old and worked out every day, I looked great. But over the years, and being married, having three kids, and working 18 hours a day, I gained basically 100 pounds. And it's been a long process of losing that weight in the last four years. But if you look at the photos and the videos of what I looked like four or five years ago versus today, the results are dramatic. I'd already cleaned up my diet, I was working out hard, but I'd only lost about 20 pounds. It was adding the other key ingredients ingredients from InfoWarsLife.com that helped me personally go to the next level and shed another 35 pounds. This has actually made me feel so good that uh, here lately, about a year ago, I started training jujitsu and that kind of led to doing some boxing and kickboxing. I mean, it's, it's amazing that two years ago I was on the couch and couldn't even tie my shoes. And now I'm training with MMA fighters and uh, just doing stuff that I never thought that I'd, I would be doing ever again. So Super Male Vitality has allowed me to do some amazing things. And if it has those kind of effects for me, I know that it will do great things for you. So just try Super Male Vitality. I promise you, you'll love it. And finally, let's look at Anthony Gucciardi, InfoWars.com reporter. He also works with Dr. Group and others helping develop the newest, most cutting edge, high quality supplements. Let's take a look at what happened when he tried to barefoot ski for the first time with the Steiners. And remember, we're not making fun of him. He had the will to get in the arena, and he's lost more than 10 pounds in the last few years of fat and gained more than 10 pounds of muscle. And Anthony chalks it up to super male vitality as well. Bottom line, folks, you want to discover the power of super male vitality and super female vitality for yourself by visiting InfoWarsLife.com today or by calling toll free 888 253 3139. Now, as we've covered this Oregon standoff with uh, some of the Bundys who are at the Bundy Ranch standoff that I covered, I've tried to make it clear that while I admire Ammon Bundy and his brothers, I believe they're making a severe tactical error with this standoff. And we're going to talk about the Constitutional Convention because I admire Governor Abbott, but in the same way, I believe that he's making a severe tactical error by calling for a Constitutional Convention. First, what's going on at the Bundy Ranch? Is there a better way to achieve this? Yes, I think so. We saw an article that the New York Times put out that's linked by Drudge, the larger but quieter than Bundy push to take over federal land. Eh, not to necessarily to take it over. Let's understand, this is the people's land. It should have been turned to over to them when these areas became states. That's the whole point. And of course, instead of talking about the Bundy Ranch, uh, the Bundy, Oregon standoff at this point, they talk about Ken Ivory, somebody that we have interviewed here on InfoWars. Alex has talked to him and his organization, the American Lands Council. And they say it's been funded mostly by donations from county governments. Why is that? It's because of the oppressiveness of the federal government, and they lay some of this out. Understand also that in Utah, where Ken Ivory is a uh, legislator, the governor there back in 2012 signed a bill asking for the federal government to do the constitutional rightful thing, and that is to turn over those lands to state management. But of course, the federal government just ignored that. Now, the New York Times article makes some interesting cases here, things that don't have anything to do necessarily with grazing rights or mineral rights that are hard for people in suburban and city areas to understand. It talks about things like access to the national parks that you can understand. Here's an example. In December, Phil Lyman, a commissioner in San Juan County, Utah, received a 10-day jail sentence after he led a protest ride on all-terrain vehicles through a federal area that had been closed to motorized use. He said, all I did was drive down a canyon road, a road. He said, it seems to be getting worse. The federal agencies are expanding. Their restraints are being overstepped. It's not the way this country was set up. It's not the founder's design. Here's another example. They say about an hour's ride from the wildlife refuge where Mr. Bundy's group is facing off with the government. Erin Maupin and her husband, Jeff, pay the government each summer to feed their cattle on 19,000 acres of federally owned land. She said that like many ranchers, they wanted to work with the government. 
But the layers of grazing restrictions and environmental rules were getting out of hand. She said, we want somebody to make sure we're doing it right. But it's gotten to the point where there's no common sense in it. That's the point. There's no common sense in it. They are just shutting the areas down. And of course, as we reported last week, the uh, congressman from the area where the Bundys are occupying that facility in Oregon had talked about how the federal government tried to shut down access for runners. They had a runner's trail there where they had about 20 people at a time going with the uh, youth groups that were going out there, Boy Scout groups, that sort of thing. They tried to shut that down. And they had to fight them to keep them from shutting it down to foot traffic or to keep them from shutting down canyon roads as this protest came about. But here's the bottom line. And they understand they're starting to see what is happening now, although they may not see the roots of this action. They say the land policies now are basically lock it up and throw away the keys at a commissioner in Garfield County, Utah. He says it's land with no use. The local economy has really suffered as a result. Yeah, they're making everybody poor. Grazing has been reduced. We used to have a thriving timber industry. That is all but gone. And see, this is by design. This is Agenda 21. This is the 2030 sustainability plan. You have to understand that that is the plan to lock this all up. So how do we control the government? Well, last week we had the Texas governor here took on the challenge. And I agree with him as to what the problem is. And I agree with the fact that he's taking action. We still need to take a look at that action, though, even though we like Governor Abbott, even though I support what he's done, even though I appreciate the fact that he's taking action, we still need to look at what that action is. And of course, here in Texas, the, in the Red River Valley, the BLM is trying to take away private property, saying that re, literally redrawing the boundaries, property that has been deeded to these families for decades, in many cases over 100 years, taking away, I think it's over 150,000 acres. I'm just going from memory on that. So what do we do? Well, the governor says Congress is unable to control itself, so the people must impose control. I would say this. Congress is unable or unwilling to control the bureaucracy, the courts, and the presidency. The Congress has become a rump organization. They have invited this dictatorial government, this unilateral uh, push for all this, the Congress is doing absolutely nothing. And so the solution does have to come from the states. As Governor Abbott said, the states must lead the way. I would say the people have to lead the way. And part of that is going to be working with the states. And understand, too, that it's just as I said about Governor Abbott, we don't fall in line necessarily on a constitutional convention because he proposes it. Understand, two days before Governor Abbott proposed it, we had Marco Rubio propose a constitutional convention. And he said all of the right things. He said, we want to promote a, con a convention of states to amend the Constitution and restore limited government because the government is out of control. He said, the framers of our Constitution allowed for a constitutional convention because they knew our citizens were in the ultimate defense against, were the ultimate defense against an overbearing federal government, okay? And he says, this is necessary because Washington's refusal to place restrictions on itself. Now, I would ask you, when he says, we knew that our citizens would be the ultimate defense, who is going to be going to this constitutional convention? Will it be you and I? Or will it be people like Marco Rubio, like John Boehner, like Nancy Pelosi, like Harry Reid? Even though he's retiring now, there'll be somebody like him. It will be the leadership of the mainstream parties that will be going there to amend our Constitution. And that's my first concern about it, one of my key concerns about it. But I also believe that there are many things that we can do that don't have the risk of a constitutional convention that would involve us directly, things that we could do directly. Let's take a look at some of the things, however, that Governor Abbott has proposed in his detailed plan, restoring the rule of law. Prohibit Congress from regulating activity that occurs wholly within one state. Well, I would argue that under the Constitution, they don't have the authority to do that. They have appealed to the Commerce Clause. They've appealed to the General Welfare Clause. Understand that I think those arguments are very specious, even if they were true. They're still superseded by the Ninth and Tenth Amendment that make it clear that unless they have been given express uh, authority in a particular area, they don't have it. Understand that this kind of uh, intervention within the state boundaries came about during the FDR regime when they were trying to regulate uh, food and control farmers' prices, and you had a farmer who said, I'm only selling within my state. They said, we don't care. You're affecting it all the way across state lines. So it's been the, 
the uh, executive branch in conjunction with the judiciary as FDR packed the courts that has overthrown the rule of law. When we take a look at this, when we t the story that I had earlier about the lady who was going around robbing 